Good morning, everyone. Just letting you know that you're in the right place. Um, we're due to start in a couple of minutes. I just want to give people a chance in case anybody's having difficulties logging on. Um, just give people a chance to join us and then we'll get started. Okay, good morning. We're, we'll get started now. I hope, um, I'm, I'm sure a couple of people will be joining in while I'm introducing the session, but um, you're all very welcome to the Food Safety Authority of Ireland's Breakfast Bite session, Back to Basics Food Safety. It's our first time doing this online. Usually we run the event in our office, so that limits numbers. So it's great that so many of you can join us this morning and um, I hope you, you find the session valuable. My name is Helen Crowley. I'm an information executive with the Food Safety Authority, and I'm going to take you through the session this morning. So just a couple of things before we get started. Your microphones and webcams are inactivated, so you won't be able to use those, but I will be taking questions at the end of the session. So if you want to submit a question, you can use the chat function, which is the little speech bubble up at the top right hand side of your screen. Now, the session is due to run for 40 minutes and we will be keeping to time and that's including questions. So um, I might get a chance to answer all of the questions, but what we will do is in the days following the session, we'll put a document together with all of the questions we received and the answers. And I'll also include links to any of the materials that I reference in the presentation. Just to say as well that we have included some resources there in the handout section if you want to download those but don't worry, we will send on links afterwards. If you'd like to share this morning's session on social media, it's hashtag FSAI events, and our Twitter handle is at FSAI info. That would be great just to let people know that we are still working away on food safety and checking that everything is, is going okay in the food industry. And, um, you know, we're here to give advice and guidance to food businesses as well. So, if you do think of a question following the event um, that you don't get to submit to us, don't worry, our advice line is still operating. So you can email them at FSAI, um, info at FSAI.ie with any questions that you have. Just to say also that I will mention COVID-19 uh, several times during the presentation, but this presentation is really focused on the basics of food safety. So if you are looking for information on COVID-19 and how it affects food businesses, we do have a comprehensive FAQ on our website. If you haven't seen that already, um, you should find all the information you need there. OK, so um, I'm going to get started. I will turn off my webcam while I'm going through the presentation and I'll turn it back on again later on for the questions. OK, so the reason we decided to do this back to basic session is because um, our inspectors during the course of their inspections time and time again find that the majority of non-compliances with food law relate to basic food hygiene and food safety. So we thought it was no harm to do a refresher on the basics of food safety. I know food businesses have a lot to think about, uh, not just at this particular time, but uh, during normal times as well. And it's not just food safety that you have to take into consideration. 
So sometimes the the basics that you need to have in place, maybe they um, slip out of focus and it's no harm just to do a little refresher for yourself and for your staff as well, just to make sure that you are uh, making sure your food is safe. So let's get started. I put this slide together just to give, um, I suppose you could call it an exaggerated example of what you could be offering to your customers if you're not looking after the basics of food hygiene and food safety. But to be honest, we do come across this and um, all you have to do is have a look at the reports that we have on our website where food businesses have been closed. And these are a lot of the things that come up again and again. So you could be offering your customers a menu of rat droppings, dirty floors, rotten meat, dose of food poisoning even. And this really isn't what you're after. So what can this mean for your food business? Well, first and foremost, you're breaking the law. OK, so you should be complying with food hygiene law. You could have a possible business closure, loss of reputation, legal action from affected customers and financial implications. And in relation to business closure, just to say that we do a press release every month and um, you've probably seen that uh, with all of the food businesses that have been closed for one reason or another. And we publish these on our website, website along with the reports um, from the inspectors that detail exactly what the reason was for the business being closed. And they remain on our website for three months, irrespective of whether the food business reopens or not. So it's uh, good to bear that in mind. So you don't want to wait for this sort of scenario before you act. OK, these are worst case scenarios. You want to have all of your food safety basics in place and then you go uh, a long way towards making sure that the food that you're serving or buying in or preparing or selling on is safe. OK, so what are the basics? Well, we're talking about personal hygiene, cleaning and sanitation, waste disposal and pest control storage, transport and delivery, and training and supervision. So the aim of the game here with all of these really is to make sure that you're not spreading food poisoning bacteria or allowing food poisoning bacteria to grow in your food business. So in terms of personal hygiene, that you or your staff aren't a source of food poisoning bacteria, that you know, you're, you're doing proper cleaning, that your waste disposal practices aren't causing problems, that you have proper pest controls, that they're not bringing in bacteria, and that the way you're storing and transporting food isn't a source of um, contamination by food poisoning bacteria. So you have all of these in place. You really are well on the way to making sure your food is safe. And the law that we're talking about is the food hygiene legislation. It's regulation 852 of 2004. If you want to have a look at that, you should really, as a food business, be familiar with this because this is the basis of all of the food hygiene rules. Um, so it covers the basics that we'll be talking about today and much more. So really important that you, you familiar, familiarize yourself with that. OK, so let's start with personal hygiene. So we're going to look at three areas, hand washing, glove wearing, and illness. So that's if your staff member is ill. We'll talk about hand washing first. So hand washing, very topical at the moment. All the talk about hand washing at the moment relating to COVID-19 and preventing the spread of a virus using hand washing. So people are more aware of the importance of hand washing. But really, as a food business, this should be fundamental part of your business that you have proper hand washing procedures in place that everybody knows how to do it properly, because it really is um, a, a barrier to the spread of food poisoning bacteria. So uh, I know it's going to be a bit obvious, but I'm going to go through the proper hand washing procedure. Everybody should be familiar with, but I don't think it's any harm just to go through it again. So you want to wet your hands under warm running water, use enough soap to form a good lather, rub all parts of hands with soap and water, Lather for at least 20 seconds, vigorously and thoroughly rubbing all hand surfaces, including the fingertips and thumbs. Rinse your hands thoroughly with running water and then dry your hands thoroughly using disposable paper towels if possible. So two important points about hand washing. The first one is that while warm water is recommended, it's not um, the be all and end all. Really, the most important part of hand washing is the use of soap and the actual physical action for the 20 seconds that removes the bacteria from your hands. 
And then the second important part is making sure your hands are properly dry because any moisture left on your hands provides a nice environment for bacteria to grow, which defeats the purpose of your hand washing in the first place. So when to wash your hands? Okay, so when would you think you have to wash your hands? Well, you're talking about before starting work, after coughing, sneezing, or blowing your nose, before handling cooked or ready to eat food, or after handling or preparing raw food, after handling waste, after cleaning duties, after using the toilet, after eating, drinking, or smoking, after handling money. So basically on a regular basis. If in doubt, wash your hands. If you wonder, should you, just do it anyway. That would be our advice. Okay, moving on to wearing gloves. So what I'd like to do here is just do a little poll. Um, I'm going to ask you a few questions and you should see um, the poll will pop up on your screen um, in just a couple of seconds. And I just want to get an idea of um, your opinion on gloves whether you wear them in your food business or not, um, and if you are in favor of them. So the first question is, is glove wearing part of your business? So if you can um, click on your screen, we'll see. Oh yes, okay, so we have uh, opened the 70%, down to 60. So we're talking about, yeah, 60, 30, in terms of yes, 60 something percent wearing gloves and 30 something percent not wearing gloves. So two thirds of you um, have glove wearing as part of your food business. Okay, great. So the next question is to do with whether you think wearing gloves is better than bare hands. So let's see how you think on that one. <clears throat> Okay, yeah, so we have the opposite way around for this one. Two thirds of you think that wearing gloves is not better than bare hands. Okay, good one. And then the final question is when should gloves be changed? Okay, so when going on breaks, after doing other activities like putting out uh, bins regularly and after activities other than food activities or all of the above. Oh, excellent, excellent. Everybody's choosing all of the above pretty much. So yeah, that's the correct answer, all of the above. Okay, super. Okay, thanks so much for taking part in that. Um, so we will Go back now to our presentation and okay, just bear with me one second. Technical difficulties. Okay, sorry folks, just bear with me one second now. Okay, now apologies for that. Okay, so um, the reason I wanted to ask you those questions was that um, you really need to take a few things into account when you're wearing gloves within your food business. So there are problems with wearing gloves and 
The first one and the main one is that it gives a false sense of security. So if your staff don't understand how to use gloves properly, then um, it can cause all sorts of problems. It can nearly be worse than not using the gloves at all. It's often not combined with proper hand washing. And if you're wearing gloves, you really need to make sure that it is combined with proper hand washing. So when you're changing gloves, you should really be washing your hands because the environment within the glove is nice and moist and warm and any bacteria on your hands can, um, can grow within the time if you're wearing your gloves for a long time. So it's really important to wash your hands when you change your gloves. Oftentimes, you can, carry, you can find people carrying out other activities while wearing the gloves. Again, this is because of the false sense of security the gloves give. They feel once the gloves are on their hands, then um, that's, that's all that they need to do. And you can often touch their face, nose and eyes without even realising it. And you actually see a lot of this at the moment. I've noticed it with, with COVID-19 that um, a lot of people are wearing gloves, you know, delivery people and the postman and I've no idea what they're doing while they're wearing those gloves, you know, um, and they probably feel that they're safe because they're wearing the gloves, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're uh, protecting either yourself or people that you're coming into contact with if you're not using them properly and are quite conscious about um, what you're doing when you're using them. So in the poll there, we mentioned when you should be changing your gloves. So really, when you change activities, you need to change your gloves as well. Um, if you are in a business where, you know, maybe money is tight and you can't provide your staff with sufficient quantity of gloves, then you're really better off not using them at all. Because what staff can tend to do is put on a pair of gloves and think, OK, these have to do me for ages because we don't have any more gloves. So um, better off not using them in that case and really drive home the, the hand washing, uh, proper hand washing routine. OK, so. The third aspect of personal hygiene, uh, when we're trying to minimize you or your staff being a source of food poisoning bacteria, is uh, when your staff member is ill. So really the most important ones um, are vomiting and diarrhea. Staff must not work with food if they have vomiting or diarrhea because they can be a potential source of food poisoning bacteria. Now at the moment, it also includes not working with symptoms of COVID-19. Um, but you can get advice on all of the aspects of COVID-19 and um, reporting it from hse.ie. We'll just really cover the um, food poisoning bacteria today. Um, staff must tell their manager if they have vomiting or diarrhea or symptoms of COVID-19. Obviously, you don't want to go into work with any of those. In the case of vomiting and diarrhea, uh, really your staff should not return to work until at least 48 hours after the symptoms have stopped. For some food poisoning bacteria, it could be even longer, uh, but in general, um, we'd say 48 hours. And um, this is because even after the symptoms have stopped, you can still be shedding the bacteria and this can cause a problem uh, within the food business. So as an employer, you must make sure that your staff are fit to work. This is a legal requirement. So it's a good idea to have uh, some sort of fitness to work assessment form um, that they would complete before they start employment <clears throat> excuse me in the first instance or when they're returning to work after an illness and you can keep records of that just in case there are any issues that you would have a record of who was sick and when okay so moving on to the next area that we're going to look at you're talking we're going to talk about uh, cleaning and sanitation again a lot of the information in this presentation will seem very obvious and simplistic but that's really the point you know these are the basics that you you can forget about because they seem so obvious but really they're they're really so important so things to think about in terms of cleaning you want to make sure surfaces walls and floors are in good repair and ensure easy access in areas for proper cleaning so when you're designing the layout or setup or if you're adding in something new make sure that you think about how easy it's going to be to clean um, in the future have a proper cleaning schedule Make sure staff are trained properly so they know how to clean properly. They know what needs to be cleaned and they know when, that they're aware of the cleaning schedule and that they use it properly, that it's not just um, a form filling exercise. And it's important to take special care with complex equipment. So what we mean by complex equipment is equipment that's difficult to clean. So examples will be vacuum packers, modified atmosphere packing machines, meat slicers and mincing machines. So it's really important that it's not just that they're difficult to clean, but 
it's really important that within your food business, if you use these, that you have separate ones for raw food and separate ones for ready to eat food. So you're totally uh, preventing the risk of cross-contamination between raw and foods that aren't going to be um, cooked any further or heated any further before they're eaten. In terms of cleaning, I uh, just want to take you through the um, proper state steps in cleaning. So again, this might seem a bit basic, but sometimes it's not done right or people get a bit uh, lax in cleaning. And if it's not done the right way, then you're nearly better off not cleaning at all. You know, um, it defeats the purpose. So first thing to do, cover or move any food out of the way, just so you're not spraying anything on it. You want to pre-clean. This is a really important step to get rid of any loose material or bits of food that's hanging around on the surface or the equipment, because when you use your disinfectant or sanitizer, they'll be inactivated by any uh, bits of food that are left there and um, they're not going to work properly. So the next steps, clean with detergent, rinse that off and then clean with your disinfectant and always follow the manufacturer's instructions because this can vary. Now, if you're using a sanitizer, those steps are combined. Uh, sanitizer combines the detergent and disinfectant. So then you give your final rinse and allow your surfaces and equipment to air dry. And air drying is really the best way of drying things. Uh, not always possible, but it is uh, the best way to do it. Always have separate designated cleaning materials for kitchen and toilet areas. Goes without saying, but I'll say it nonetheless. Um, that's just common sense. Now, cloths, these can be one of the top causes of cross-contamination in a kitchen. They can be a real, uh, I suppose, wellspring of bacteria if they're not uh, changed regularly enough, if they're left lying around, if they're not hung up to dry. So really important to consider your cloths, consider whether it would be better to use disposable cloths, or if you're not using disposable cloths, make sure that they are washed properly and regularly enough and changed regularly. So um, you don't want to be spreading bacteria around with your cloth that you're supposed to be using to clean things. All right, so moving on from cleaning to waste disposal and pest control. Again, another two important areas to consider and maybe things that don't um, pop into your mind all the time. So for waste disposal, you want to have a designated waste area that's protected from pests. Make sure it's easy to clean and disinfect. Again, always should be a consideration when you're doing anything. In food areas, you want to use a bin with a lid and ideally ones that are opened with a foot pedal so that you don't have to touch the bin. The bins must not be a source of contamination. And you should remove your waste at least daily from food areas, but you might have to do it more often. That's going to depend on your setup, uh, but just don't let it overflow. OK, moving on then to pests. So this is something that we hear a lot about uh, on our advice line. We get a lot of complaints from consumers uh, where they've spotted pests and um, particularly rats uh, and mice in food businesses and particularly in the city centre where you do get a lot of rats. So really important to be aware of pests and the potential they have to bring um, bacteria into your food business and potentially contaminate food and surfaces. So. Important to know what the signs of pests are and important that your staff know what the signs of pests are so you can get on top of any issues very quickly. So in terms of rodents, you're talking about looking for small footprints in dust, droppings, holes in walls and doors, nests, gnawed goods or packaging. That's quite common to see. Grease or smear marks and urine stains on food packaging, all very unsavory. In terms of insects, you might see the bodies of the insects, you might see live insects, maybe some webbing, um, some nests, you might hear the insects themselves, and you might see uh, maggots as well. And then birds, you're talking about feathers, droppings, nests, uh, you might hear the birds, or you might actually see the birds themselves. So important to know these and to keep an eye out for them. So you don't want to wait until you have a scenario like this where you obviously have quite an infestation of um, rats or mice and uh, you know proper checks and proper pest control program will actually uh, mean you're not going to get to this sort of a stage before something is done. So what 
do we mean by pest control and how do you put it in place? Well, you want to make sure, first of all, that your premises is in good repair and have regular checks for potential access points. So trying to keep the pests out of the premises in the first instance is really important. You want to have regular checks for signs of pests. Employ a pest control company or make sure that pest control is carried out by a competent person within your food business and keep food in pest proof containers. So all really important to keep them out in the first instance and if they get in that your food is in a pest proof container and it's difficult, know the signs and make sure your staff know the signs as well. Okay, moving on then to storage, transport and delivery. So um, I know a lot of food businesses now um, with the current situation have moved from premises based activities to delivery. So we thought it'd be no harm just to have a look at um, what you should be doing to make sure that you're keeping food safe during transport and delivery. So first of all, we'll just have a look at storage when you're storing food, what you want to consider. So you want to make sure again that you have clean, suitable storage area and uh, containers that your containers are again in good repair and easy to clean, that they protect the food from contamination, that you have proper separation of raw and ready to eat food so there's no cross-contamination issues there, that food is stored at proper temperatures and that you have good stock rotation. Again, all common sense, but no harm just to think about all these things again from time to time. In terms of your transport containers and vehicle, so you want to keep these in clean and in good condition. Again, protect the food from contamination. Make sure they're easy to clean and or disinfect if that's necessary. Make sure they're not used to transport goods other than foods where this could be a source of contamination. And again, allow separation of food from non-food items like detergent and toiletry. So if that's part of your food business and you're now delivering a mix of food and non-food items, make sure that they're kept separate so there's no uh, contamination and allow separation of raw foods that require cooking from foods that will not be cooked before eating, okay? Temperature control is really important during um, storage, transport and delivery. So it's really important that um, you consider these three types of uh, foods. So foods that need to be refrigerated must be kept below five degrees. Frozen food must be kept at minus 18 degrees and hot food must be kept above 63 degrees. So you want to make sure that any containers or vehicles used for transport or delivery can maintain the above temperatures. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that you need to use a, an insulated vehicle or a refrigerated vehicle, but so you could use something like um, a cooler box with ice bricks to keep food cold or um, a cooler box to insulate hot food to keep it above 63 degrees. But it, whatever way you decide to do it, you need to take into consideration as well, you know, um, how long you'll be able to maintain those temperatures. So you might need to have shorter delivery times. You need to take into account the um, number of deliveries you'll be doing. And also, um, as we're coming into summer, you know, you'll have hotter temperatures and uh, temperatures inside a vehicle can get quite hot. So you want to make sure that the food will stay at the right temperatures in those conditions. In terms of delivery personnel, um, so follow HSE guidance, obviously, on social distancing when picking up deliveries and passing deliveries to customers is something new we're all having to get used to. Uh, wear suitable, clean and wear necessary protective clothing. Maintain a high degree of personal cleanliness. Sanitize hands before and after each delivery transaction. The use of gloves is not recommended. We discussed the reasons why that can be an issue. So really hand washing or probably sanitizing if you're out in the road is best practice and the best option. Um, I think you're inclined to be more conscious of your hands if, if they're not in gloves. So we'd recommend um, just using the sanitizer and not using gloves. Just a note, if you have changed your business activities, then you're legally obliged to notify your inspector. So if you're changing things around, which a lot of food businesses are, um, yeah, just get in touch with your inspector and let them know when they can amend your uh, records. Okay, so the last section we're going to cover is on training and supervision. And this is a really important area because if your staff aren't trained and don't understand the importance of, um, you know, 
proper hand washing, proper cleaning, uh, bringing out the waste, um, looking for signs of pests. If they don't understand why this is important, then um, you know, you're in trouble. So it's really important to focus on training and supervision. So the basics of good training, it should be an ongoing process. So really important that it's not a box ticking exercise uh, or not something you're doing just to show the inspector that your staff have a certificate. It's really important that you're on top of the training all the time um, and that there's buy-in from management because if management don't buy into training and aren't keeping an eye on staff, um, then uh, you know staff can just go back to doing things the way they were doing before they had any training. It's important that there's provision of proper facilities to allow for safe and hygienic work practices. We mentioned the gloves earlier on, you know, if there's not sufficient stock of gloves, then you're better just not to have them at all. Um, for proper hand washing, need proper hand washing facilities, paper towels, etc. So all of that must be provided or you can't expect your staff to work hygienically and safely. You must have proper supervision of staff so you can keep an eye on what's going on if there's any problems coming up. And then retraining if necessary. So you might need to have your staff retrained if you notice maybe that there's some bad practices sneaking in or sometimes an inspector will actually re request that you have your staff retrained. So some good resources, we have these in the handout section, but just to highlight them here, we have um, the first two there, the orange and the purple one are our training guides. They detail the skills that your staff should be able to demonstrate within certain time periods of starting work with you. They're really good to kind of uh, put a structure on your training, give you an idea of what they should be doing. The purple one is really geared towards management um, and that includes information on HACCP as well. The third publication there, Safe Food to Go, this is a great booklet, really good for training staff, very simple information on the basics of food safety, covers food poisoning, bacteria, hand washing, importance of temperature control, so all the things we're talking about today. And it's a nice colourful publication, so it's very accessible. They're all available on our website to download free of charge if you're looking for them, but they are in the handout section, as I mentioned. So. Just to summarise, make sure your staff know how to wash their hands properly, clean properly, dispose of waste correctly, identify signs of pests and store, transport and deliver food safely and hygienically. And this means that you're well on your way then to making sure that your food is safe. And remember that it is actually set out in legislation that the food business operator has the primary responsibility for food safety. So bear that in mind, you know, it's really important that you have all these basics in place and make sure that your food is safe because it is your legal responsibility. Just wanted to point out if you're in the catering type business or you're even thinking of setting one up, then we have um, our safe catering pack, which is a practical, easy to use food safety management system. So when you've worked your way through the pack, you'll have your food safety management system based on HACCP. Using the pack helps you to produce safe food, comply with food hygiene law, train your staff and also protects your business reputation, which we mentioned earlier on, all the things that can happen if you um, aren't putting all these um, safety measures in place. And you can uh, buy the pack at, uh, on our website, so it's fsai.ie forward slash safe catering and it's only €100, Euro, which is a really good price for what it will deliver for your food business. The other um, good uh, resource we have on our website that's worth having a look at um, and recommending to your staff to have a look at is a learning module we have called Why Food Safety Matters. This um, It's a video based on a true story of food poisoning and really the impact of that on both the person who gets the food poisoning and the food business itself. Also has additional information on the importance of food safety and tips on how to make food safety a priority in a food business. So really um, beneficial to have a look at that. OK, so we've reached the end of the session. I hope you found it useful. I'm going to switch back on my webcam now and um, I'll take a few questions. My colleague Elaine is going to help me out. So um, she's going to hopefully have it. Hi, Elaine. Good hi, hi, Helen. Hi everyone, I'm Elaine Gibson from the FSAI Communications Department and today I'm going to ask Helen some of the questions you've been sending in during the presentation. Great, thanks so, Elaine. No problem. So Helen, the first question is in relation to closures. So if a food business is closed by an inspector, 
is it inspected again before reopening? Uh, yes, it is. In in the case of a closure, yeah, food businesses are closed when there is perceived to be, um, or where the inspector finds that there's an immediate risk to public health. So the business will be closed, the business will be advised on what they need to do in order to reopen, and then they'll be given a time frame and the inspector will come back to do a visit to make sure that everything's in order before they'll be allowed to reopen, yeah. Perfect, thank you. And we also have another question in relation to closures. So if or, or if a business has just been closed for a while, so the question is, if my business has been closed for a while, do I need to do a deep clean before I reopen? Um, it depends. Depends on the reason that you were closed in the first instance. So we'd always recommend discuss with your inspector. They'll advise on exactly what you need to do and um, they'll issue you with a report that tells the reasons why they closed you in the first place and then what you need to do in order to satisfy them that it's okay for you to open again so we'd always say just discuss it with them may not be necessary but it might be yeah depends perfect thank you Helen um we have a question about what the correct temperature is for a fridge in a freezer okay so your fridge should be uh, five degrees or below and your freezer minus 18 or below make sure you're keeping the food at the right temperature. Very, very important. Thank you, Helen. And we have a question about what the steps are in setting up a food business if you're doing it for the first time. From scratch. Okay, yeah, so scary times for anybody looking to set up a food mm -hmm. business. But if it is something you're thinking about, yeah, there's a couple of things you need to do. So you need, first of all, to notify more than likely the local environmental health office, they're part of the HSE. The majority of food businesses will uh, register with them. So they'll send you out a registration form to fill in. Um, you need to familiarize yourself with the food hygiene legislation that I mentioned earlier on in the presentation. You need to make sure you have what's called a food safety management system in place. So we mentioned the safe catering pack, that would be valuable for someone starting a catering type business. Um, but you can put in place a system yourself. You don't necessarily need a, a pack to do it. Um, and then you will also need to make sure your staff or yourself have food hygiene training of some sort and also have a traceability system in place. So that's a legal requirement as well. And that allows you to trace where your food is coming from and where it's going to if you're selling to another food business so that if something goes wrong, you know exactly um, where things have come from. Excellent. Thanks very much, Alan. Just, sorry, just to yeah. say as well that we do have um, information on our website on starting a food business. There's loads of information there if you want to take a look at that. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, earlier, you explained very well the basics of hygiene. We have a question here about gloves. Um, so the person has said, I have an employee who wants to wear gloves, but I don't want them to wear gloves. What do I do in this instance? OK, so, yeah, I think this probably boils down to um, the misperception of wearing gloves, that it's safer than, um, you know, not wearing gloves. And it's something like we do get a lot of complaints to our advice line from consumers who've gone into a food business and they're not wearing gloves and they feel that they should be wearing gloves. So there really is a misperception out there about wearing gloves. And I think we we talked um, in a lot of detail about the problems of, of wearing gloves and the false sense of security it can give. So I think it's important to explain to your staff member that why hand washing is so much more important than wearing gloves and that your policy within the food business is to have proper hand washing as opposed to wearing gloves and that it's, it's as safe, you know, that there's no issues with not wearing gloves. Perfect, thanks very much, Helen. Now, finally, we have two questions on pest control. So the, in the first question, the listener asks, do I have to, um, sorry, can I do my own pest control rather than have a contractor? Yes, you can, yeah, absolutely. If you don't want to get a pest control company, um, you can do it yourself, provided you're, you're, you feel competent to do it. It is a good idea maybe to get a company, but not necessary legally. Okay, perfect. And there's also another question in, in regard to pest control. Um, what do I do if I found a mouse in my restaurant, but not in my kitchen? Okay, well, um, obviously, even if it's not in your kitchen, it's still in your food premises. So you want to have a really good look around to see if it's definitely not in your kitchen. 
um, and if there's, there's no signs, because sometimes they can be hard to spot. I would, if you have a, a pest control contractor, get in touch with them immediately to get them in to see if there's any issues. Um, it could just be a one-off, but it could be a problem at the same time. So you want to get on top of that and also let your environmental health officer know that there is an issue, but that you're, you know, you can tell them what you're doing about it and um, yeah, take it from there then. Okay, perfect. Thanks very much, Helen. Um, that's all for now. Any remaining questions we will answer in the follow-up email. Thanks everybody for joining and I'll just pass you back over to Helen. Thanks. Great, thanks a million, Elaine. And thanks everybody for all of your questions. Yeah, we, uh, we're running out of time now, so we won't get to answer any more questions. But just to reiterate, we will send out that document with all of the questions and answers. And if you think of a question subsequently, you know, get in touch with our advice line info at fsai.ie that's absolutely no problem we can answer any questions that you might have so i hope you found the session this morning valuable i'm not sure how you um heard about the event but just to let you know that you can subscribe on our website to our events it's fsai.ie forward slash subscribe and um you'll hear about our events that way or keep an eye on our social media we let you know about upcoming events there we um do have an allergen breakfast bite that's coming up on the 4th of June. That's a Thursday at the same time, so 10 a.m. So um, there will be details of that coming shortly. OK, so thanks again, everybody. I'm going to end the session now. I really appreciate you tuning in this morning. Bye for now.